So we'll just get started. We'll start on the right, and um, after the question on the right hand side, we'll go to the question on the left. And so please go ahead and um, ask your question. Hi, Professor Sen. Thank you so much for coming to Georgetown. I'm a student at uh, SFS, and I'm actually just taking a class on intro to social um, choice theory, so I'm really glad to meet you here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I come from China, and I know you have visited China in the past years as well. So I'm really curious about your opinion on China's social development progress, especially when the 19th Party Congress is happening right now in China. So what do you think about the setup of China's political and eco economic system, which emphasizes distribution according to labor? What do you think of uh, that system in achieving social justice and distrib both distribution? And what do you think is the biggest problem that's facing China right now? Thank you so much. That was 18 questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, social justice has many aspects. Am I the audible? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in some of them, China has done brilliantly, a lot better than India. In some others, that's not the case. I think if you um, if you look at the the fact that the that the poor in China and poor in India are not similar. This is the first thing to recognize. Namely, the poor in India does not know where to go if you have a medical problem, mostly. You wouldn't find the hospital which they can afford. Doesn't have a school within walking distance of which you could be sure which has a certain standard and where you can, where there's more than um, one teacher so that you don't have to worry about your daughter being there in case that teacher isn't there and what would happen. So the education, the healthcare system, the social safety net are much better organized. That was always, not always the case. China did have the largest famine in world history. Uh, during the Great Leap Forward period. But that is the case now. And it's not the case in India. The, uh, that is the denial of this. Uh, so the, the life that the Indian poor lead is immensely worse, and you can't judge it in terms of per capita income, even of the poor. Nor can you judge the level of inequality between China and, in China and India if you look at the Gini coefficient. They are very similar. But that inequality is not the same in the sense that, despite the fact that the, the rich in China lead a life which is um, enormously uh, more prosperous than, than many people in India. In India, of course, you have the labor and so forth. And so you have servants and an and, and empire, really. On the other hand, in China, you have got, you know, the the luxury cars, so probably, I mean, there are many in India. But in terms of the kind of wine you drink, the Chinese, we look at the lifestyle of the rich. There is, in some standard way of measuring it, greater prosperity. And yet, at the level of the forest, there is a major achievement in China, which doesn't exist in, in India. And that's very important, by the way. And it's not the question that you ask. I'm asking making it 19 questions now. <laughs> Namely, I was asked by the New York Times when China went off the one-child policy to say how much of a problem did I think it would be, and uh, they gave me, more than they normally give me in an op-ed pay that took pretty much the whole thing. I had to explain that China did not get their fertility reduction because of the one-child policy. China had a fertility rate about six, six per couple, roughly, um, in, uh, in the decade, in the beginning of the decade preceding uh, the introduction of one-child policy in 79. But between 68 and 78, China came down from six to three. 
roughly um, 5.97 to um, uh, 2.98, something like that. Before anything has happened. And this was happening as a result of education of Chinese women, the Chinese women's empowerment, and their ability to work outside home, and having a bigger voice in family decision. And no lives are as badly affected as by the frequent bearing and rearing of children as that of young women. Anything that increases their voice, this is something that you have found from research, comparing Indian districts, comparing different countries. Nothing explains fertility differences as much as the voice of women, and particularly women's education, women's independent means. By the way, to continue the story, after from coming down from six to three, it went from three to about 1.7 or 1.8 in the following decade, much smaller form, while education was also increasing and contributing to that. So the Chinese got a lot out of that, which are better for quality of life and better in many ways, and in fact also for industrialization. The fact that the Indians make three different things, uh, basically in, in terms of world export, namely IA, information technology, uh, pharmaceutical, and more so far, where the Chinese can make anything. I, I take, pick up from my pocket, almost anything could be made in China. That's possible when you're educated. A point that Adam Smith had mentioned already, more than a quarter of a millennium ago. So these are all great achievements of China. And yet, do I, since I disagree with the government often, not only the present government, but the past government too, I think Man Wong gave a reply, and Suman did not give me a chance to reply to Man Wong. <laughs> but, um, I replied, and uh, do I appreciate the fact that I can say, and life is not only education and healthcare, there are all kinds of other problems. Do I appreciate living in a democracy? By and large, a free press, though it's getting less and less free, as we know from someone's own experience in this. You may have noticed bits when I talked about things like cow, and they wanted the cow to be taken out, and they wanted my reference to the killing of minorities in Gujarat to be taken out by, I think, beefing up Gujarat. Nevertheless, we have still more freedom left, and I think someone would win this one ultimately too. Uh, do I think these are important? Yes, they're extremely important. But you see, in some ways it carries. I'm sorry, I'm giving such a long answer. My children always complain that they're hesitant to ask a question because I give <laughs> such long answers. <laughs> the, the, in order to bring about a change in India, you have to convince a whole lot of people to win an election. Of course, you don't have to get a majority to win an election. Uh, uh, BJP of Mr. Modi got 31% of the vote, but huge majority of the seats. But still, you need a lot of people. Whereas in China, if you convince 12 or 13, 14 people at the top, you may be able to bring about a big change. That makes it in many ways much sharper when China had a policy which was mistaken, like the Great Leap Forward. That meant 30 million people dead. But when they decided that education and healthcare were very important, and this was part of the, we have to admit it, old Maoist belief that these are very important, uh, that they got straight away, and they were able to carry this out. So this is the advantage. We, India, we celebrate things which are worth celebrating, but that puts a bigger task on us. And that's why meetings like that are important. I don't mean the film, which I enjoy, by the way. But, uh, also, discussing it, like the AID, which was being discussed, joint action is important. Uh, I think I was referring to Mahatma Gandhi towards the end of the film. And I think it's extremely important to do this joint work. In India, it has to be earned much more, rather than be lucky with the top leadership. The Chinese are 
leaving out some issues, quite lucky in terms of poverty is concerned, in terms of the top leadership. They do care about that. And I've gone, you're right, I do go to China. I go to China every year. And I've been going there since 81. And I've seen how the territory has changed. And how, as the leadership, became aware of more and more problems, things have changed. And even I've been invited by the China Research Foundation, for example, to talk about <coughs> under school children, to talk about midday meals which China didn't have. So there is a constant pursuit. And if you succeed in convincing the top leaders, you will get it. Now, of course, in India at the moment, I think it's not possible to convince the top leadership on any of the importance of any of these, unless you say that somehow it would lead to greater glory of Hinduism. And I'm sorry that that is the case. I, I'm very proud of, uh, of India's culture. I'm very proud of the achievement also of Hinduism, along with Buddhism and India, it, and Islam, its influence, the Kabir and Dadu, and, and the vows and, and the mixture. But there is a difference where democracy makes it harder to earn it. That doesn't mean it's a worse system. It means that we have to work harder. That's where the difference is. So it's a mixture of points. And as a Chinese woman, uh, I think you should be very proud of some and be a bit concerned about others. <laughs> Thank you so much. I can ask the next, next question. Hi. Um, my question is mostly on the theoretical work of uh, Professor Sen and uh, Professor Basu. It's on Arab de Blue and comparative advantage. Um, what I want to ask is, do you think that in the asymmetry of information is a consequence of Sorry, what, what is it? Do you think the asymmetry of information? Asymmetry of information, whether it's a consequence of? Is a consequence of specialization. So the doctor does know more about the patient, uh, does know more about medicine than the patient. Well, surely that's a good thing. The patient knows something else. Um, and we would be worse off sending the patient to medical school to be able to evaluate the doctor's advice. And you can extend this argument to, you know, the lawyer knows more about the law than the client, the architect knows more about buildings, the professor knows more about education than the student. Um, and it seems to me that it's these asymmetries of information, is these differences that make trade possible. Yeah. I, I, you know, first of all, let me say, it would, uh, I'm very, uh, it's a very good question. I'm very happy to answer it. But if I may, as a person participating in this discussion today, it would be nicer if the question were related to something you might have seen in the film. This is something which you've thought about it before you came to the hall. And yes. likely it's to your glory that you thought about it, but it's not connected with the difference. So that's for the others to, if I may say that, because it would be nice to hear what you thought about it. Now, I think asymmetry information is a fact of life. And that's why you take specialized education. Um, and that's why people do engineering, economics, mathematics, law and so on. It's, it's not a question of whether it's good or bad. That is one of the, one of the things to be aware of. What, has it, what is the implication of that? One of the implications is important of education. It's important also of specialized education. Don't dismiss it. I was craving school education. That's really the most important, but I don't know. Then you get specialized medical education, legal education, engineering education. But there is a very important political lesson. When you have asymmetry of information, the, you cannot solve the problem with the market economy. And the medical care is one of them. Since the doctor always knows something, and when a patient goes to a doctor, she or he does not know it. What the doctor knows, it's not like the normal market economy. Market economy, all the theorems apply. When you have commodities where you know what it is, uh, it, if you're buying a toothbrush, you know what the toothbrush does to you, and so on. Now, what is really one of the reasons why the market economy has not delivered 
healthcare justly in any country in the world, including this one, the United States, is connected with the asymmetry of information. A point that Kenneth Arrow, of whom you say, sorry, uh, his choice was very good. I would say Kenneth Arrow and Paul Samuelson are possibly the greatest economists of our time. And the asymmetry of information is a paper, is a subject on which Kenneth Arrow dealt with in the American Economic Review in 1963, showing why a market economy can never produce a just medical care system. That is a huge lesson for the debates in America. Because despite the fact that America has the finest medicine at the top level, you would have not been able in this country as well, you're still struggling whether you're to live with 40 million or 30 million or 20 million uninsured and so forth. So I think that's where the question is, important topic is, not whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It is a thing that exists. Okay? And then I, my request is, could you confine, could you possibly relate your question to Suma? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Sen. And uh, my question was actually to all three panelists. Um, so I want to know if you are concerned about the rise of, or the apparent rise of religious intolerance in India. So with respect to the controversy regarding lipstick under my burqa in the film industry, or with the beef ban that the Supreme Court luckily um, uh, resigned it. And because, it. I'm sorry, which they put a hold on, which they put a stay on. So I want to know what your thoughts are as regards to the causes of this and what can be done to stop it. Well, um, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear Professor Sen on this, though I can more or less predict what he will say, still I want to hear him. Uh, uh, but um, my own view is, yes, indeed, this is something of great concern. And one of the things that, um, since you are asking this in the context of India, something that I felt very proud of India was precisely the space of tolerance of religion, religious practices that, um, happening under the sort of same roof, same skies. And that there is this rise of intolerance is, I think, just very, very unfortunate. I'm optimistic enough, I feel, that a lot of ordinary Indians feel the same way today. In fact, Hindus, devout Hindus, feel that it does some damage to Hinduism when you take a very narrow-minded view of the religion. So I just feel hopeful that this is a passing phase and it will go away. Um, so, um, Related to me, um, you know the reason why I took up this film, like shot the film again in 2017, we saw after 15 years, I, I, it was not planned initially. It was a completely different reason why I started the film and the reason why I continued was one of the main reasons you said. Uh, not only in India, but generally, you know, the world has changed so much in the last five, six years, I would say, dramatically. And uh, I typically make feature films and uh, I was feeling very frustrated. And I remember I was having a conversation with my brother uh, who lives in Boston that, you know, I feel very frustrated as an artist, uh, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, though I am making feature films. So then, you know, in that conversation, it came to my mind about, well, I have an ammunition, and that is Amartya Sen. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I genuinely feel that here is a voice which uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, particularly if you see his work, his thoughts, his beliefs, and that is being questioned. And uh, so since you mentioned about India, so let me relegate my you know, arguments, particularly with India. And uh, it is you know, now common knowledge how uh, you know, Professor Sen has uh, continuously criticized and argued about things which he did not feel was right. And I thought that, well, this is a good ammunition. I, I will want to re, uh, reactivate or you know, shoot again this documentary. And uh, I will want to release it. Well, then he alluded to this, and probably many of you know that uh, after the film was made, I was planning to release it in small theaters. I had talked to everyone related to the film industry and all. And then the censor board came up with this. Uh, you know, they wanted to delete Gujarat, Hindutva, Hindu, 
and you know some ridiculous uh, thing. So I was quite shocked. But you know, in in a very weird sense, I feel uh, my uh, reason for taking up this project again uh, vindicated by this reaction of the censor board. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, or however you want to see it. Uh, it made a national or rather international news. Uh, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian, everyone, BBC, we did an interview together. So the reason why they wanted to probably stifle a voice like Professor Sen, the, I'm talking about the government in India, it backfired, he said. So I, you know, I, I, I told them that I'm not going to make any uh, changes. It is ridiculous to beep out the words which he feels, and these are objective facts. Uh, and you know, I can. I think I will make a short film about my interaction with the censor board. Uh, <laughs> it was so funny and bizarre. Funny. It was like Bunuel's film. And uh, so then, uh, you know, I. Uh, so, going back to your question, yes, it worried me. I decided to act in my own way. Uh, how I can make my statement through him. Of course, I'm a very small. Uh, fry in this entire gamut of things, but uh, uh, you know, I'm not, in a sense, I'm vindicated by why I took up this project against the religious intolerance which has been encapsulating our country for the last three, four years. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with what they said, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think, we, as you said, we do uh, see. But I think there's more dimensions to it. There, first of all, I think uh, uh, quite uh, rightly Koshik said that it doesn't do glory to Hinduism uh, either to, to take this view, because that's not a view that people have taken, that there wouldn't have been so many arguments preserved in, in documents, in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in the Gita. The Gita is one long argument which was one guy and another with different point of view. So I think the tolerance of difference has been a feature of Indian culture, and to deny that is to do great disrespect to the culture. And even the Hindu culture, not to mention Indian culture, when broadened by other influences, like uh, the influence of Islam went through uh, Kabir, Dadu, influence on, uh, through that mayor by the Baus and so on. But Akbar and his, uh, I mean, was remembering that when uh, in the beginning of, uh, at the end of the uh, 16th century, uh, the early beginning of 17th, when uh, ap uh, apostates, mm -hmm. non-believers are being burnt in Campo di Fiori in Rome, on grounds of heresy, uh, Akbar was codifying uh, why every religion has to be tolerated and the state has to provide the protection. We have a long history to be proud of. On top of that, we do have a constitution, which also protects all these things. I was pleased that the Supreme Court reiterated them when they gave a judgment, a nine-judge judgment dealing with the privacy issue with Chandrachur and others writing some of the critically important parts of that. But the, the difficulty in India is that there is a distance between court judgment and actually getting it implemented mm -hmm. in particular cases. We've seen it again and again. So there is a real issue, but there's no question that it is against the Constitution to kill someone <laughs> on grounds that he's trying to prefer meat of the kind that, that the killer doesn't like. Uh, and so forth. So I think there's a major issue there, but I think, again, I come back to the question, the way of stopping it with, is, I think, resistance. I think that's the, you know, I think it's very important to read what happened in Italy in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the 1920s. Uh, I'm not comparing fascism with the extremism of the Hindu society, but there is a similarity of a narrow view overtaking a very broad nation. And, uh, and it happened with considerable speed. Uh, my uh, late wife was Italian and died of cancer. 
quite young, but um, her father was in in uh, in resistance and was shot by Mussolini, killed by Mussolini uh, in Rome two days before Americans came to Rome. So that was a, a long period. If I look through the uh, paper through the 1920s and 30s, it's really extraordinary how quickly that was. Uh, you know, there are propagandists going around everywhere uh, and making a major impact on the population. There's some similarity with things <laughs> right now. But I end by, on this remark, by referring to Kosik saying that he wants to hear me say, even though he knows what I will say. <laughs> <laughs> and often that is the case. Sometimes not, and since I was in the Italy in the 1920s, I, let me tell you a story where I think uh, where you might not quite expect what was being said. This was a fascist recruiter, very uh, um, versatile, going around the villages and explaining to everyone why they should join the fascist party, where a major achievement, uh, malaria had been vanished, the trains are running on time, and so forth. And then he gets hold of the guy and he says, look, I can't join the fascist party. Um, and why not, says the recruiter. He said, because my father was a socialist. We come from a socialist family. My father was a socialist. My grandfather was a socialist. My great-grandfather was a socialist. I cannot possibly join the fascist, join the fascist party. To which the fascist recruiter said, this is a very silly argument. What would you have done if your father had been a murderer <laughs> and your grandfather had been a murderer, your great grandfather had been a murderer, what would you have done then? To which this chap said, well, then, of course, I joined the fascist party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hello there. Uh, my name is Justin Archangel. I graduated from the George Washington University last year. Uh, I have a question about perception and uh, happiness and inequality, uh, but it's one question I promise. Um, so they, they found in studies that you know about $70,000 um, is what you need to, to have a, a level of happiness that uh, where your returns are diminishing with, with increased wealth. Uh, and they also found that people are happiest you know, within those middle and upper classes when they perceive uh, a disparity of wealth between them and, their, and the people that surround them. Uh, that, that essentially if you perceive uh, a more unequal world, that your wealth means more to you. Um, they, they've also found that you know, the perception of inequality is a very powerful political tool. Uh, that if you can make people believe uh, that, the in, that the imposition of inequality uh, is a threat to their livelihoods, that you know, to some people um, who have privilege, equality feels like oppression. And so I'm wondering, in the elimination of inequality, uh, how do you balance that perception uh, that when things are more equal, that there is that political violence or that opportunity um, to to create that kind of agitation uh, that that could you know kind of I guess backfire or, or set the world back a little bit. In, in terms of reaching that goal. I guess, how do you create allies while you're eliminating quality um, that, that could help further that goal? And of course, you know, we have a filmmaker here who deals with perception um, and two very esteemed people you know, who, who speak on this issue. I can also clarify my question, but <laughs> is it essentially, how, in the elimination of inequality, how important is the perception You know, I, the, there are different types of inequality. Some types have a very strong per perceptual element. Others do not. When some people can get excellent education and then go and run, run the Microsoft and Google and Deutsche Bank, and others can't, can't do the multiplication table, it's not a perceptual difference. So while, as a good academic, you may be interested in the most sophisticated of inequality issues, 
of his perceptual one would be spot. We should not overlook what non-academic can immediately see that the lives of different people both extremely different. And that must be denied, your question. But maybe more immediate questions to ask? Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I, I'm like in a class on development of India and I really struggle with grasping um, the idea of a national identity because I feel that um, by studying Indian history, um, one inherent aspect of the Indian national identity is poverty, which is like means that in a sense poverty is romanticized or to relate to the um, previous question that um, the perception of disparity and ec economic inequality has is tied to the freedom struggle. For example, Gandhi himself, he was an educated um, man, but he has to like create an identity that is equal to um, that of the Indian lower class. Um, so I wonder like how can India overcome the narrative of a nation that is poor in order to create change and um, to create, like to develop, um, how would I say, to industrialize in a way that is beyond self-sustained, grassroots um, e economic. Question, Kahal, for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I actually fully followed, but let me tell you, um, uh, if you're talking of the romantic, uh, romanticizing of poverty, at times there is a genuine dilemma that when you want to give self-respect to people, mm -hmm. to tell them that your condition is bad but not bad enough, you do that just to make that person feel reassured. On the other hand, you can cause, um, create out of that a cussedness about the state of the world that everything is fine. And after all, we know that dreadful forms of oppression from slavery to caste systems have been perpetuated by making people believe that that is your lot. Yeah. And that's the way somehow it was meant to be. And it was comforting for people to know that there isn't something I can do immediately. But on balance, when the inequalities are huge, discriminations are very big, as indeed they are around the world, there is a case not to sit back and have people feel aroused and disturbed and troubled by the state. You agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> yes? No follow up, I would say thank you so uh, okay, much. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, you for making this movie. Uh, I think it's great to have this preserved for, for years to come. Uh, and I also appreciated the music and the poetry in the movie. It was very nice. Uh, the Beethoven and then the Rubinat. Um, so this question is directed towards um, the economist, development economist on stage here. Um, so I have a personal interest in development economics. And um, so all the, the projections of population, global population, show like, you know, Africa's going to double in, in 2050 and then double again in 2100. Asia's going to double. And it's going to sort of cap out at 11 billion in 2100. And so in terms of global poverty and development, you, know, you, you see poverty going down, but there's still pockets of you know, destitution, especially in Africa, where you have like really high you know, uh, fertility rates and things like that, and you have a lot of tropical diseases. So the, the question is this. What is, is, is there a general framework to think about development? Like, so I'm, my mother was a socialist, my parents were socialists, everyone was socialist. I turned out a libertarian in America. So I'm more of like a right-wing guy, so I would think more in terms of property rights, rule of law, contract law, economic freedom, and access to markets as <coughs> the means to prosperity. And then you can then tax those businesses and individuals making money and then distribute to for health and, and, and education purposes. I, that's the framework I have. Now I would like to hear you guys talk about this. 
That's a pretty tough question to ask. Um, do you want to have a go for that? I, I can jump in on this a little bit. Um, first of all, on libertarian, there is a big left libertarian school as well, which sort of comes around, which is not too unreasonable. So you can link to your heritage through the left libertarian <laughs> school. Um, on development, my own view is, um, I, I'm sort of straying a little bit from your question. We typically, when we think of development, we think in terms of more of the same, more cars, more homes, more clothes. The way we have to think of development, if it is to be sustainable, we can continue to grow at phenomenal rates. The world is currently growing at, say, 3.6%, 3.7%. I believe that if the world is to survive, it'll have to grow even faster. But what constitutes growth is going to be totally different, and we should help that. For instance, health could improve dramatically. Life expectancy could improve dramatically. We don't value those things because they are not amidst us, amongst us, those kinds of things. But then, so the nature of goods is going to change completely. So when you get growth, it'll be a growth in terms of value, but not in terms of more goods of the kind that we are consuming today, which is not feasible. And we ought to put our mind towards that new kind of growth. Um, I'd like to comment a little on your population thing, because there was a shade of Malthusianism there, which I think I detected. <laughs> First of all, I think it's extremely unlikely we'll get to 11 billion, but that's a demographic issue on which you and I could talk, because looking at the rate of fertility rate coming down, and if you have any kind of success, even with very little success, women's education and women's um, uh, gainful employment, these are the two factors that reduce the fertility rate. With any kind of projection, you could see that that's not going to happen. So, but let's accept that. When the world had less than a uh, billion people, Malthus thought that we were so overpopulated that it couldn't possibly survive. And that question bothered him so much that he wanted to save the world from becoming two billion. Two billion. Adam Smith in the Earth of Nations and in the, in, in the theory of all sentiments takes on these questions as to how these illusions are generated about the boundaries of what we can do or how much food we can grow and so on. And he says that it's not the case only that very relatively ignorant people think of that, but if you look at the history of the Athens, an ancient Greece, and he knew that his readers <coughs> would always regard ancient Greece and Athens to be certainly the epitome of, uh, of enlightenment. <coughs> the fact that they would, they thought that it's fine to kill your children because there are too many of them coming and society cannot maintain them, and you take them and leave them for wild beasts to kill in the Middle East. That was not my suggestion. But <laughs> that may not be your suggestion, but there is this, it comes from a sense of dejection that comes from assuming a problem which doesn't really uh, have the, the force that you might assume. Because as uh, Smith discusses, Aristotle says this is a good thing to do. Plato says it's a good thing to do. Not because they wanted children to be killed, but they thought that it's not feasible for society to have prosperity with so many kids coming as they were coming at that time. Now, that was just wrong. I mean, if they were, if they had studied it, they would have taken a different view. So Malthusianism and the general dejecting attitude has always survived on incomplete analysis of a problem. And there is a very important lesson to learn on that. Not all libertarians, by the way, take that view. I, for many years, for 10 years, I talked with a great libertarian, namely Robert Nozick. There was a Nozick and Sven class for 10 years. Uh, he was very much a libertarian, but he never thought that the kind of problem that he was raising would, would have been a serious one. 
I think it's wonderful that you could have libertarian children out of socialist families. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always the case. I, I was celebrating, and this is really a personal story from last week. A very close friend of mine, with whom and, and a great political scientist, but uh, quite right wing, uh, with whom I also taught a class, Eric Nelson, and he was um, he comes from and, and he had a 40th birthday, and his parents all came, parents and relations, and this seems like a completely, very strongly liberal, not libertarian, liberal in the American sense family. And on the other hand, that's not his. He's, he's one of the smartest guys I know. By the way, his book called The Royalist Revolution is very worth reading, the way he argues that the American revolutionaries were not against the king ever. They were against the British Parliament. And brilliantly argued, but comes from a very liberal family, which makes it more interesting too, so I, I gather that one of my friends, um, Priya um, uh, 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 Nataraja, yeah. when he asked the mother, she said, you know, I was in, during pregnancy, I wasn't feeling very well, and I took an antibiotic, and this might have been the result. <laughs> <laughs> that somebody was very right-wing, we got generated at that time. So it can, it can become a subject matter of joke, but I think that we celebrate a world when that is possible. And that was not unrelated to a question that was asked earlier. If when you feel that there's something totally wrong happening, and the socialist story that I meant, I do know, was arguing against the opposite, because it, it ultimately ended up with reasoning as to why he would have joined the fascist party. So it wasn't a story that if you are a socialist, always a socialist. I think the ability to disagree with your family, with your society, with everyone, is really a major quality of human beings. And I think one of the things that make us distinguishable from animals who continue to do exactly the same thing. So I read things saying that animals too learn to differ from their point of view <laughs> on some research. So cheer up. <laughs> Thank you. May I? Um, well, thank you for being here. And as an icon, wow, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a Nobel laureate. I think many of us, so thank you for being here. I finagled the last question, so I'm only allowed to ask one question. But I'm going to throw one thing at you, Professor Sen. Um, before uh, my interest is in the cinematography aspect, so before I get to Dr. Suman Ghosh. Yes, I will get it to. The statement is that if 1%, uh, the top 1% owns 60% of the planet's uh, wealth, how close are we to um, civil disobe disobedience just like History has dictated again and again between the haves and have-nots. Um, but that's a question I have not been allowed to ask, so maybe I'll get the answer from you later. Professor Ghosh, um, the question I have for you is, this has spanned over two decades or three decades. What is the difference you found in the cinema? And by the way, thank you for having the actual icon up there rather than Amitabh Bachchan playing the icon. So I'm very, you know. Thankful for that, but what was the difference you found in that, in your cinema, you know, filming the whole thing? The, the cinematography, you mean? Overall, just making the movie with a 15 year span, was it easier now or not, as compared to doing it 15 years ago? I don't know uh, how to ask, answer that question in the sense that when I made this, uh, the first part in 2002, I was, I just graduated from my, uh, from Cornell. I did my PhD and Koshi Bhattu was one of my advisors. And uh, I, I was uh, not a filmmaker by any means then. But I, you know, went to Cornell, I took the filmmaking courses. So I was very, uh, if I would say, uh, youthful energy, but uh, immature uh, as a filmmaker. 
And uh, well, then at a later stage, after making so many films and all, so I realized that sometimes the youthful energy is not that bad after all. And I, I took that thing. But it, it was an interesting experience to go back to where I started my filmmaking career 15 years uh, before. And, uh, you know, c uh, cinematography, I, I can just say that the picture quality was very bad in the initial parts and in the next one because it was shot in, a, in beta, which is non-existent these days. Uh, so you can feel the distinct difference in uh, the cinematography. And I'm trying to sell it as, uh, you know, it was intentional, but it was not <laughs> to, to make this different. So, um, yeah, I think that's what I think. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, um, one way, uh, for sure, uh, you decide while using real characters, as it were. I think that was a question with which you started. But the, um, is that, of course, people express their point of view, which may or may not be correct. For example, I don't agree with, with my, one of my teachers, named the, uh, uh, Dirichbaum. Dirichbaum. That presidency coverage was very unimportant for me. In fact, it was extremely important for me. In many ways, more important than KJ was. And of course, as I say, that disagree with one woman, but then again, you didn't say there was one of my views, those are his views. That doesn't stop me from respecting you. And uh, indeed, I uh, said many things in the defense when he was being so much attacked. And, uh, um, uh, I think the, the interesting, and also I disagree with Ken Arrow yeah. when he uh, described the human development, that if everyone go off in the same way, it won't change. That's not, not true. And in the, in the memory of uh, Mabubul Haq, I have to say that he would not have tolerated an index with that feature, the whole thing. I met Mother was hugging my first day in Cambridge. I was walking to class, he was walking to class. He was very nastily dressed. And he asked me where I was going, and, and I told him, Joe Lawrence and stuff. And he said, Oh, yes, I'm going there too, but we are both late. It's a, it's a state, of, uh, state of existence in which I often am. Uh, and then the, we arrived, and we arrived about how to enter it, but it turned out that Joe Robinson was eight minutes later than us, <laughs> and came later. But when we sat down, the case was clear, and uh, I want to say this since there was so much nice, and nice things said about me, to say it about something of my friend, Mabu Bula, that even as an undergraduate, he knew very clearly he wanted to do something which would be exactly what you would say, more than just income. That it would make life, actually we said something which may look like a, uh, not a very nice remark to say, he for example said that if the present rate of growth is double of India and Pakistan, in 40 years we will have the same per capita income in Egypt as Egypt. We should be happy with that. Now, I want to explain that Mabu was not anti-Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, he, like many of us, admired Egypt enormously for things not connected with his per capita income, but his history and so on. But I think what he was saying is that there are things we can do. He was saying, first of all, we have to think about what the criteria is. Secondly, it's an optimistic view too. Things we have to do, which is not like in 40 years reaching the level of Egypt's per capita income, but in 10 years, making the country much more educated, much more healthy. Like in Meiji Restoration, Japan, 1868, they decided in 40 years they were going to make the whole country fully literate. And by literate, I don't mean the Indian criteria of signing your name, really literate. <laughs> and they achieved that. So I think there is a, an enormous uh, optimism in that 
feature of, uh, of the point of view that people very often have. Uh, and but, uh, I'm also pleased that some of the points of view that you express I'm in a position to disagree. So I can say that at least my argumentativeness does not stop <laughs> at only dealing with, um, I mean, these were all very good friends and very, they were saying very nice things. But when they, when, uh, even though they're saying nice things, when they say something which I don't think we, I have to say that. And that, by the way, is really, if I may say today, when you mentioned why you wanted to make a film of this kind, and I was delighted that you thought that I could serve as something there. But right now in India, the ability to disagree, not shutting off newspapers, because they say things that are not favorable to the authorities, which is happening a lot. As a result, the range of opinion expressible in India has really shrunk which I think in many ways is probably the biggest challenge India faces because if we have to have a successful democracy, and that is the most important thing that India has to safeguard and use to make other changes, then I think the ability, the courage to disagree, as well as having the opportunity to express your disagreement publicly is really very important. And what I heard of AID, I take it that that's one of the things that you are committed to, but so are many other organizations. And we, they need, many of them need support. I think the space has nearly narrowed in a big way. This may be too serious a thought if it, it's to send you to have dinner, but uh, I did want to have an opportunity of saying that. I, I ought to say that. Uh, after also noting that I thought that you, they, I mean, I'm biased party, I'm contaminated by being me, but I thought it was a great film, so I really enjoyed that. <laughs> so if I may congratulate you on that, but send off to one ghost with a further message to the world. And so actually somebody asked me the question about uh, you know, 15 years later taking up, and I think I'm quite proud of the new name of the film. It was, uh, the previous name, I didn't like it, and... Uh, you know, but you, you have succeeded in one other way too, because, you know, time has passed. <laughs> and uh, you, in the early thing, I look quite youthful. Now I don't look youthful, I'm very aware <laughs> of that. Especially for 50, 40 years of running, which I thought at that time was a healthy thing it was. But of course I didn't know I was ruining my health. I won't be able to walk around. Uh, one of them has been replaced, but the other not yet. But you succeed in making, look, making me look as if any moment I'm about to collapse. And <laughs> 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 which, is, which may be the case, but it, it's slight exaggeration. <laughs> So, and uh, I, I say about the name Argumentative Indian because I didn't know what he's going to say in 2017 when I shot that. And you saw that he started arguing with Mahatma Gandhi at, <laughs> at age 11. And that tradition still continues <laughs> even now. So I found, when I was watching it now, I thought that, wow, at age 11, he started <laughs> arguing with Mahatma Gandhi. And this is so important, particularly in current India, this argumentative I could, tradition. I could complete the story by saying that when I was, when I thought I was doing it, he was being extraordinarily tolerant. <laughs> extraordinary, <laughs> unbelievable. If somebody 11 years came to me and I had asked these questions about the Bihar earthquake, I think, uh, I, I think I would have given him a much rougher time. But he was, he wanted to know why, how would I develop the argument? At which point his mind came along and he said, uh, basically wants to say go home. So, <laughs> so he came and he said, you know, um, uh, I think you have to continue this argument another time. <laughs> and I evicted me. I said, really, I was so much enjoying it. And he said, yeah, but you have to enjoy it in another time. <laughs> that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> uh,
I realize I'm the most unpopular person in the room right now <laughs> uh, to draw an evening of this nature to a close. Uh, I want to thank our partners at AID, and particularly to acknowledge in the room one of the founders of AID, Ravi Kuchimuchi. We're a honor to have you here, so thank you. Uh, we hope the spirit of Diwali moves you to donate generously to the work AID's doing. I mean, a few things could honor the legacy of Dr. Sen's work on development and freedom than to contribute to an organization putting that into practice on the ground. You can donate both outside as you exit here this evening, but also online at aidindia.org. It's such a remarkable evening. Not only have we had the, pre the benefit of you know, a teacher, student, and another student of that uh, other teacher, but also to learn, of course, that it, through Dr. Sen, we have a direct connection to Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Rabindranath Tagore as their teachers. Uh, so as us students, we are truly uh, in your in your debt. We're very, very grateful. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you'll come again to other events of the India Initiative. Uh, thank you. Happy Diwali.